welcome to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Akam, and we are broadcasting from the Hesselson studio on Market Street in Corning. I'm so glad that you could join us. We've got a lot to cover this morning. Uh, we're going to highlight some things coming up, too, uh, that I think you're going to find very interesting. As always, you can contact me. You see the number on the bottom of the screen there where it says text, TXT. Uh, please contact me there. You can text or you can leave a voicemail, and we will try to get to it on the program either today or on future broadcasts if it is still relevant after a, a weekend, maybe a long weekend. Speaking of that, we're all getting ready to celebrate July 4th, a very special day in our nation's history, of course. Uh, so we all have fun. Maybe you're having a cookout. You're getting ready for the fireworks. I, I've heard some places are canceling fireworks because of the smoke. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. July 4th is coming up, and hopefully you have a nice long weekend, however you're working that out. But I received an email from, I believe it's called Wallet Hub, and they put together, sometimes they're really out there, the most, they'll have things like most free states, most independent states, but sometimes it'll be really obscure. Well, this one was 2023's most patriotic states in America, so it got my attention. We know at a time when people are giving up on patriotism, as a matter of fact, we talk about it on the program a lot, where there are certain circles that if you are patriotic, if you say you're proud of this country and you think we're exceptional, they'll laugh at you, that they'll uh, mock you. Uh, They think you're a backwoods rube or something. Um, It's very unfortunate. So I want to look and see what states are the most patriotic and which are the least and where that leaves New York for our New York viewers and Pennsylvania, for our Pennsylvania viewers. Uh, Now, the article says, despite the problems facing the country, well, the problems facing the country are very much due to the policies of Washington, the inflation, the economy. Uh, But again, that's not why I'm getting into all this. Around 87% of Americans will still gather on July 4th, the most patriotic day of the year, it says here, to celebrate the good in our nation, in order to determine where Americans have the most red, white, and blue pride, Wallet Hub compared the states across three or 13 key indicators of patriotism. Wow. I wonder if they have a list of what the 13 are. I don't think I, don't think I saw what the list of indicators are, but that's not important. We'll take them at their word, I suppose. Wallet Hub, uh, the gospel according to Wallet Hub. No, they, they do do a good job. But the number one most patriotic state virginia in their metrics the number one most patriotic state in the country and we can go through let's just name the top five virginia montana alaska north dakota and maine now you'll notice in the top five uh, neither of our states have come up yet (laughs) let's take a look at the least patriotic i was a little surprised by this arkansas least patriotic uh, followed in 49th, and not really followed, but 49th, Massachusetts, 48, Rhode Island. Well, where will New York and where will Pennsylvania stand? Well, you'll find out after this quick commercial break. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox, stay with us. <laughs> We are back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Akum. Coming up in just a little bit, we're going to be talking with Robert J. Delahunty. He's the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. And I heard from a lot of you yesterday when we had our guest on, the Honorable Amul Thapar. He has a new book out called The People's Justice. It's about Clarence Thomas. I heard from a lot of you. I know you appreciated that interview. Clarence Thomas often getting a a raw deal in the media. Well, today we're going to talk to uh, Mr. Delahunty. And we're having, yeah, two days in a row, Supreme uh, Court-type interviews, I guess you could say. Uh, We're going to ask Mr. Delahunty about Clarence Thomas, but about, you know, such things as the Brett Kavanaugh hearing and, you know, maybe who he thought was a great justice or was a bad justice and those type of things. So stay tuned for that. We were talking before break. I know, I'm sorry, I kept you hooked. According to Wallet Hub, the most patriotic states in America, and we said number one was none other than Virginia and then Montana, et cetera. So we were reading the least patriotic states. And I read you 50, 49, and 48. The reason I didn't read you 47. 
47 is where New York ranks in patriotism. Out of 50 states, we're at 47. Now, there's probably a lot of reasoning for that. Um, and you can kind of be the judge. And actually, our friends in Pennsylvania that are tuning in, you're at 42. Uh, so 42 for Pennsylvania, 47 in New York. Now, let me just take a look at New York. New York, a very, very blue state um, with the thought process of a blue state. So, you know, even though there may be state issues, some of the things coming down from Albany still affect your overall view of the country in general. But I'm sure that if you went to New York City and certain places and certain places around here, for heaven's sakes, and were very patriotic, waving the flag, talking about your love of country and our exceptionalism, you would be mocked and ridiculed. Um, it's unfortunate. So I, you can understand why we rank so low. 47. It's, it's discouraging, especially for so many of us in the audience that are patriotic. But it goes to that larger picture of what we've talked about since I think the first broadcast of this program, where the polls show that people are losing faith in community and religion, and they're not patriotic. Well, I think that's a, a, the culture coming from media, coming from Washington, for heaven's sake, some of our politicians who badmouth the, the country. So it comes as no surprise that that's going to wear off on people, to rub off on people, where they eventually say, eh, shrug their shoulders. Yeah, it's very troubling. And that's why we on this program try to uh, change that around as best as we can in our little slice of the world to say, no, this is an exceptional country. This is a great country. And we should be proud of it. And we should always be working to make it even better. And that's what we, uh, why we focus so much on community, why we have charitable organizations, why we have on our local politicians, because we have to have faith in our community. The more we have faith in our community, the more that grows to where you believe in the goodness of this nation, the greatness of this nation. Also on this, they did the average number of military enlistees, which was um, one of the metrics that they used to judge most patriotic state. Um, we did not make the list, Pennsylvania or New York, when it came to highest. The highest is Georgia, then Alaska, the lowest, North Dakota, and Vermont. But I thought this was interesting. Veterans per capita, and this paints a larger picture, so bear with me. Veterans per capita, the fewest by state, 50. 50th is where New York State was ranked. So we have the fewest veterans per capita. And my thought on that is because people are leaving the state in droves. It has nothing to do with veterans. It's all uh, categories across the board. So we're going to talk about that because there's a piece from E.J. Antoni uh, from the New York Post that speaks to this, which is the high taxes. And, and he doesn't mention it specifically in um, the uh, headline. But you have high taxes, people fearing for their safety. You have so many rules and regulations on your life here in New York State that it's not just veterans that have left. We may have the fewest veterans, but it's an uh, overwhelming exodus of citizens from New York. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we come back. As I mentioned, we're going to have our guest Robert J. Delahunty on in just a little bit. He's the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. <laughs> We are back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. I'm your host, Frank Acom. As always, you can contact me. You see the number on the bottom of the screen. We already have one wave. I know it's summertime, so if you're out and about and you're running and, or walking or just out for a stroll, you can always wave during the live broadcast, and we will add that to the screen for what it's worth. It's kind of fun. Again, going back to making it a part of the community. So I was talking to you about we're what, what 47 uh, least patriotic states uh, in New York State 42 for Pennsylvania uh, not a good sign but we're trying to overcome that we're going to try to do better uh, we're going to try to preach the word about this great nation but also how veterans well, in New York anyway we have the fewest veterans per capita and that was interesting because I think it's just a larger sign of people leaving veterans in all walks of life leaving the state because of high taxes, because of rules and regulations, because of a lack of safety, because of bail reform. 
So EJ Antoni writes, and he, and he mentions it, New York City, but also in general. New York City has long been the financial heart of the state, but decades of unwise government policies are sending it into cardiac arrest. High levels of taxing and spending are causing the Empire State to hemorrhage not just people, but businesses too. Uh, recent statistics from the Bureau of Labor show more firms moving out of New York than any other state. Now, I mentioned this, they, they focus a little bit more on New York City, but it's, it's obviously in upstate as well. But as people and businesses leave, Albany's not cutting back spending. So they have to make that up somewhere. Where do they make it up? On those of us who stay here, who, for whatever reason, don't leave. And you may have a reason for that, or as some uh, polling indicates, you may have a five-year plan where you do plan on leaving. It's just a matter of time. For those thinking about the state's future, he says, look for jobs or hoping their kids will find one and remain here. It's a depressing thought. Yet New Yorkers who have labored for years under high taxes, that this comes as no surprise. People have been fleeing the state for years, decades even, with residents from New York City leading the charge. But again, it's all of New York. I want to highlight that. And as business owners leave, they frequently take their businesses with them and hang their shingles at a new destination. Fewer businesses mean what? Fewer jobs, of course. And reduced tax revenue from the crumbling empire state. This may be one of the reasons Governor Hochul performed so poorly against Lee Zeldin. Now, of course, she did win in a, a very blue state. Um, but... What does this mean for the future? This, this is one of the problems I have with New York politics and why we talk about it so often. People are leaving in droves. People are sick and tired of the high taxes and these horrible policies, giving Hollywood huge tax breaks, banning um, gas stoves, these type of things. But yet our state keeps voting in the same people over and over. And I guess expecting a change or expecting it to get better has it worked for the last how many decades, but maybe it'll work this time? It, it makes no sense to me. And I know that's why many of you who reach out to me are so frustrated. And you see someone like Lee Zeldin, who we thought we had a great chance with, and he did great, don't get me wrong. And he ended up securing us the majority in the House because of all of his hard work in the state that led to uh, House Republicans uh, entering and, and changing the majority there. But you get frustrated, I understand it, but we cannot give up. That's not an option. I mean, you can if you want to leave the state, I suppose. But if you're willing to stay here, uh, we cannot give up. And it just goes back to that idea that we were talking about earlier with patriotism. We have to keep, we can only do what we can do. We have to continue to spread uh, patriotic ideals, talk about the, the greatness of the country. We have to fight to make New York specifically a better place in this instance. In 2021, the exodus meant New York lost 487 more single location businesses to other states than it gained. So other states received 487 of our businesses, single location. Now that may not sound like a, a huge number, but it's a key measure compared to the rest of the nation and to prior years. Indeed, it was the worst such loss of any state in at least three decades. Many states were gaining firms as New York lost them. And to be clear, the number doesn't include all the businesses New York lost in 2021. That, unfortunately, is far, far worse. Companies and chain stores that simply closed aren't counted in this metric. Nor are businesses that shut their New York headquarters. When they are counted, the figures explode. This again from the New York Post. During the pandemic, from the beginning of 2020 through the end of 2021, Manhattan alone lost over 5,000 businesses. That's just Manhattan. In 2022, after COVID waned, New York State had the third worst rate of business growth in the country. And I, it should be noted, uh, weekly wages, average weekly wages, fell a whopping 9.4% in the city. Now, again, this is from the New York Post, so they're focused on the city, but these are very similar problems that we have and upstate, and it affects us all overall in a, as a state. But don't think the trend started with the pandemic. New York has suffered a net loss of businesses 
to other states every single year since 1994. What's been causing the bleeding? Failed public policy, especially high taxes most of all. And, and this is business, so the taxes is probably the main reason, but there's so many other public safety. You think about your family safety, you think about your individual safety, but some of these stores closing down because they have, they fear for their staff's safety, but also the theft that's occurring so much because of bail reform. A lot of these people uh, they get in trouble for shoplifting, don't really get in trouble at all. They're back out on the streets before the paperwork's finished just to go do it again. And they can't keep eating that loss as a business. Uh, and then you've got from July 2021 to July of 2022, 300,000 more people moved out of New York than moved in. And it's not just income taxes causing the pain. The Heritage Foundation says that New York has the highest total tax burden in the country. New York has the highest total tax burden in the country and the second worst overall business climate. That's a recipe for disaster. We should add, along with the fourth highest property taxes, local sales taxes as well. So you add all that first in total tax burden, second in worst overall business climate, and then you add for the individual or individual and business property taxes. And then of course, local sales taxes. And despite all that revenue, $118 billion in 2021, New York still managed to rack up the country's highest state and local debt per capita. So even though we have the highest taxes, we're still overspending. It'd be one thing if the government spending had made New York the envy of the world, writes the New York Post, but it has been more like bloodletting instead, slowly draining the patient while claiming the treatment of more taxes and spending will restore health. And sadly, as a state, we keep voting that in. We keep saying, yeah, uh, this is bad. People are leaving in droves. You know what? Didn't work last time, but maybe this time, higher taxes, more spending. Meanwhile, look how much Florida gains from us and really from across the country because they have low taxes and they've received, because of that, the highest net in migration of businesses, more than twice the next state. I mean, these numbers are staggering and, I, and we can't spend this much time on it because I do want to get to our guest, uh, Robert Delahunty, here in just a moment, but it all ties in together on the program this morning and uh, really from numerous mornings. Uh, Reversing New York's decades of poor governance can halt the decline. And at the top of the list of what needs attention are the state's oppressive taxes and wasteful spending. Elected officials need to stem the ble bleeding soon while the heart still has blood to pump. It sounds good, but what happens every time we look? And again, you've got to vote. You've got to work hard for your candidates. But what happens? They vote the same people or the same type of people in with the same policies so it does get very very uh, frustrating but if you look at albany and you say wait a minute this is all bad the taxes are high everything well look look at albany super majority democrats controlled all they keep the high spending they keep raising our taxes and again just to reiterate, reiterate this point before we go to break that when the Democrats in Albany have a super majority. They are the ones pushing through the policies that we know that I think even maybe in their heart, but they live in a bubble. No, are causing this mass exodus. So if we're going to keep voting those same people in, I don't know what we are to expect in the future to see any of this go down. I, I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that really changes, but I don't want to be doom and gloom this morning. I'm sure there is some good news out there. But I know one good news. Uh, we're going to be talking with Robert Delahunty next. He's uh, the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. So stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. We are being joined this morning by the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court, Robert Delahunty. Thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted. So what makes the book so politically incorrect? Well, you know, uh, it's no secret. Um, the overwhelming uh, point of view in the media and in law schools is from the left. Mm -hmm. And it's been very critical, harshly and unfairly critical, of the work of the Supreme Court, especially since just, uh, three justices were appointed by President Trump. And what we want to do is right the balance and give a different perspective 
on the court and its personnel and its work, one that we think will reflect a conservative angle, which is ours, mm -hmm. but which will also appeal to open-minded readers. You don't have to be a lawyer. Um, you can be a non-lawyer of any kind, just with an interest in the court, but someone who wants a balanced and objective perspective, not a partisan perspective on the court's work. Do you feel that uh, since the hearings for Brett Kavanaugh and his confirmation, do you think that's going to be the standard if a conservative gets on the Supreme Court? You know, unfortunately, it has been the standard since at least Robert Bork's nomination sure. in 1987. Uh, and most of the time, this kind of controversy centers around a conservative nominee to the Supreme Court. It is extremely unfair. It's destructive of our political institutions. Um, and I hope that it abates. I think it will. Uh, but, you know, it's very hard to tell. Um, the Democratic leadership in the Senate, Senator Schumer and his colleagues, have been vituperative uh, in their criticism of the court. He led a rally on the steps of the Supreme Court in which he shouted, you know, uh, look out, Kavanaugh, look out, Gorsuch, we're coming for you. Right. So I don't know what to expect from people like that, um, but I hope it improves. Well, it's gotten to the point where it's dangerous when you have people visiting the houses of some of these justices. That's, that's a scary situation that they're put in. Not only visiting their houses, but actually attempting to assassinate them. Oh, that's right. And the federal government, Merrick Garland's Department of Justice, despite a law saying that the justices in their homes should be protected, a disregard of that and left them you know, to the mercies of the protesters and in one case uh, attempted uh, assassin outside. That's a disgrace. We're talking about the book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. Um, what do you think uh, currently of the current makeup of the court, and do you believe that's one of the reasons why it has been so vicious with attacks from the media and from politicians? Absolutely. I mean, since, the, since President Trump made the appointees, the balance of power on the court has shifted in a conservative direction. That is, frankly, the first time in about 80 years that the court has had a solid conservative majority. But, you know, let's be clear, being conservative on the court doesn't mean being politically conservative. Right. They've come down with several decisions um, recently that have widely been perceived as uh, injurious to the Republican Party. It's not about politics. All right. It's about a legal method. I always find it interesting that it seems like when someone that's known as liberal that's on the court, they're pretty much, uh, they're going to decide in that way, exactly the way that we expected them to. When it comes to a more conservative judge, that's not always the case. Well, you know, uh, legal conservatism mm -hmm. is kind of a big tent, uh, and I'm very happy with that. It shows a lot of intellectual vigor. Mm -hmm. um, let's take Justice Gorsuch, one of the three Trump appointees. Uh, he's from the West, he's from Colorado, and um, he knows about Native America, uh, and he's very sympathetic, unlike some other conservatives or liberals, to the cause of Native Americans. And he's shown that this term um, by some remarkable opinions in cases involving them. Why did you and your co-author feel the need to write this now? Well, because, uh, we got the idea about a year ago. It was around the time of the Dobbs decision. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, there was enormous pushback against the court. There was talk of packing the court mm -hmm. to destroy its independence and make it a tool of Biden and the Democratic Party. And we thought we would try to uh, reach out to a broader audience uh, and explain to them why the court's mm -hmm. decisions, despite being controversial, were right on the law. Right. The court has been trying to separate politics from law, and we think it's basically done a good job. We're talking the politically incorrect guide to the Supreme Court, and you mentioned the stacking of the court. Do you see that being a trend, that when something doesn't go the way of the left, that that'll continue to be brought up? It will be continued to be brought up, but I think actually what we're seeing now is a different strategy with these ethics charges, most of which are bogus, mm -hmm. against the conservative justice. That's not the packing of the court. I don't think that's the objective. The objective is the thinning out of the court to reduce the conservative majority in some cases by claiming that the justices need to recuse themselves from mm -hmm. society. It's the sort of opposite strategy. And it's interesting to see, especially specifically with Clarence Thomas, you figure right from the beginning, as you mentioned, um, how nasty the confirmations can get when you've got Anita Hill. It seems like he's never been safe in the media's eyes or in uh, politicians' eyes, that they're always going to attack Clarence Thomas, who does have such an amazing background and an amazing story. 
Well, I am a big fan of mm -hmm. Justice Thomas, and in fact, in my opinion, he's the greatest living American, and a century from now, his greatness will be recognized. But yes, he's been in liberal crosshairs since his confirmation hearings, and in the crosshairs of then-Senator Joe Biden. They never let up. They never right. forgive. They never forget. Um, Justice Thomas is a conservative African-American, man of rock-hard integrity, and they can't bear that. Mm -hmm. what you mentioned... Oh, one of your, you think the best American and also uh, justice. Who are, when you're doing the research on this book, is there a, a worse justice or not maybe politically speaking, but someone that was not qualified for the position? No, uh, the truth is in recent decades, everybody who's been picked for the Supreme Court has been hardworking, smart, credentialed, qualified. Okay. Um, it's, they're, they're, you know, they deserve a whole, all of them. I'm, all of them, including liberals, deserve more respect than they generally get. Mm -hmm. How much research went into this book? How long did it take you to write? Well, John Yu is a professor, a chaired professor of law at the University of California in Berkeley, and he had, he's one of the country's leading constitutional law scholars. Um, and um, uh, so he, decades in, in, in both our cases. Uh, I had a chair at the University of St. Thomas School of Law in Minneapolis before I retired, and now I'm a fellow of the Washington, D.C., branch of the Claremont Institute, and I practiced constitutional law on a regular basis and taught it from 1986 to the present. So well, the answer to your question is decades in the case. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. well, I'm glad it could finally come out then. We appreciate it. Thank you. Do you think that the court today, and I don't mean the conservative judge uh, justices picked by the former president, but do you think the court today overall is what the founding fathers intended? I think it's getting getting back there. I think long term, the the project of the justices is to um, get back to the original meaning of the Constitution. And it's like, you know, uh, when a painting is centuries old and it's been smudged over and varnished over, they're trying to get rid of the grime and the varnish and get back to the original picture, which is pretty beautiful. In your mind, how important is the core? to our country's future, that if we, <clears throat> pardon me, if we go that direction, if we, if we do correct or uh, right the ship, how important is it for our country's future? It would be very healthy for the country. Um, if, uh, for one thing, it will empower Congress. A lot of the time, Congress just wants to pass the buck to the executive branch and the administrative agencies, and it tries to duck hard issues, let's say, in uh, occupational safety and health or in environmental law, and the court is more and more insisting that Congress step up to the plate and take responsibility for policy decisions one way or the other. When you see some That's of the... good. Yeah, it is a good thing. When you see the decisions that are coming up, how would you say that your book helps people better understand how maybe a decision's made or what reasoning goes behind it? Well, I think the key point, it seems to me, with the book is that the court is, haltingly, but I think um, consistently, trying to move in the direction of separating law from politics. I mean, you read these headlines that say, court delivers an opinion on environment, tomorrow we will have global warming everywhere. That's just <laughs> yes. totally misleading. Mm -hmm. The court, in the case like that, is trying to interpret what Congress did, or else to say, this is a decision that is so big, it should not be left to the federal agencies alone. It's got to go back to Congress for clarification. It's not saying this is the right way or the wrong way. Right to conduct abortion policy or to conduct student debt relief policy or to conduct environmental policy. It's saying the right decision maker has to make these calls. Sometimes that's Congress. Sometimes it's the president. Sometimes it is, in fact, the administrative agencies. Sometimes it is the court itself when it's a, when it's a question of violation of constitutional provisions. But mostly it's not trying to make the policy decisions. It, right. that's, 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 it's not the right branch. It doesn't have the qualification for that. It's trying to say who the decision maker is, not what the decision shall be. And you know the subject so well, not just because of the book, but like you said, your background. Does it frustrate you when you see maybe the media's uh, mischaracterization of what the court is doing or specifically what a uh, specific ju justice is doing? Yes, it is. It is very um, disappointing. And um, the quality of um, reporting on legal matters and constitutional matters right now is very low. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing as a conservative, or at least someone with a conservative mindset, you're probably not asked to be uh, an expert on too many of these media outlets. 
uh, I got a call once from the New York Times, um, uh, and um, I was amazed. <laughs> and they asked me <laughs> for my opinion on something, and I said, look, I didn't speak to the New York Times. <laughs> so, it's one of the greatest moments of my life. <laughs> <laughs> a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, before we go, and I, I m meant to mention this earlier, and I wanted to kind of pick your mind on it. So we talked about the attacks on the justices. We talked about recently what they're saying about Clarence Thomas and others with ethics charges. What did you think of the leak and nothing really coming from that leak from the Supreme Court? Uh, first of all, the leak itself is very, very dangerous. I yes. mean, the court depends on confidentiality and trust, mm -hmm. and that is one way that the justices, despite their very deep differences, can cooperate and work together. Right. And when you have a breach of confidentiality like that, it really uh, damages the, the functioning of the court. They can get along on a personal level and on a professional level, but not if everybody thinks somebody else's office is prepared to stab them in the back. Right. Um, and then not having discovered the source of the leak is very strange and baffling. Mm -hmm. Justice Alito has said not so long ago that he thinks he knows who is responsible, but he doesn't have the level of proof that would entitle him to identify that source publicly. Um, so there are suspicions, of course, um, but for whatever reason, and that itself is a question, for whatever reason, they haven't been able to either locate the source of the leak or, or speak publicly about it. Well, and that's and, uh, what I think is interesting is someone that doesn't know the ins and outs like you do. Everything that I've seen shows that this everything's traceable from the Supreme Court in one way or another. I mean, there's not just rogue agents walking around. So how do we not know the answers? Or do you think they're just maybe trying to hope it goes away so it doesn't come up again? You, you have to suspect that. Mm -hmm. But, of course, we don't have evidence about that. One thing Alito said that uh, people should note he said, you know, he has been accused of being the source of right. the leaks, or the conservative justices, with the thought that they would try to freeze frame the draft opinion and force their colleagues to keep signing on. But he said, and he's, of course, right about that, look, the leak endangered our lives. Right. The leak is what led to the assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. So we're not the ones who did it. No, and I, I, it makes you, I would think, if you're a justice, question all of those, like you said, around you, because if you can't, if no one can be trusted, right, at, at this point? That's right. Yeah. You know, our public institutions operate on the basis of trust, trust of the public mm -hmm. in them, trust in people to observe certain norms of collegiality and professionalism. The leak disrupted all of that. It's shameful. Just before I go, to find out a little bit more about the book, is there somebody that you would recommend that may interest us, uh, a former justice, that we should look up just to pique our interest? Well, Justice Kennedy is still mm -hmm. alive, former mm -hmm. Justice Kennedy, former Justice uh, O'Connor is still alive. I don't know if they even are aware of the book, but um, <laughs> they're still there. I don't know mm -hmm. if they give public interviews. You, you yeah. Know, yeah. Well, I interesting. Think about inviting them. Oh, that'd be that would be great. Well, I you know what I think the book sounds. John, you is always available. Oh, that's right. <laughs> we, can, we, can go back, we can go back to back. I like it. We'll piggyback. Uh, the politically yeah. incorrect guide to the Supreme Court. It sounds wonderful. It's it's piqued my interest. Where's the best place that we can buy it? Uh, I came out on sale yesterday. It's online at Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, or maybe a bookstore would get it or order it for you. But you can find it online. Great. Well, best of luck with the book, and thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. All right, we'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox, stay with us. We are back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox, thank you to Robert Delahunty for being on the M.A. Neal Financial Services section of our program to tell us about that great book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. T turns out there's a lot we can learn about the Supreme Court from Mr. Delahunty, so thank you so much for being on the program. We're going to take another short break. I do want to remind you, and we're going to talk a lot, not a lot about it, a little bit about it coming up, uh, the Watkins Glen Cardboard Boat Regatta broadcast starting tomorrow right here on Big Fox, 5 p.m. tomorrow and on Sunday, 2 p.m. I hope you watch it. I'm a host. Lisa Troche is a host. So please tune in for that. We've got to take a short break, though. Please stay with us. We are back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Acom. As always, you can contact me. You can see the number there on the bottom of your screen. We're talking about, uh, well, quite a few issues so far this morning on the program. 
one, to be honest. But we were talking about the lack of patriotism in New York. We were talking about the high taxes and the increased spending in New York. And I think they're all interconnected. Um, I think they all play a role where you lose faith maybe in community or not, you're not patriotic for the country because you, you just, you're struggling to make it. You, you're told by the media constantly how bad of a, a nation we are those in Hollywood and pop culture and they make it you embarrassed to say you're patriotic but then you see the struggle because of the high taxes and the increases and it's it's overwhelming it really is and this is not doom and gloom I think that's we're just trying to describe uh, what the polling represents but it's not just of course at the state level we've seen the outrageous spending at the federal level uh, which has led to this inflation which has caused a lot of these depression type issues that people are experiencing according to polls because it, it, they're struggling to survive. According to Fox News, and specifically the Committee to Unleash Prosperity, the regulations that the Biden administration has put on our lives cost Americans almost $10,000 per household. That's not your taxes. This is just regulations and what those costs translate to you. Now, they studied Obama. They studied Biden and they studied Trump to see what the, the numbers look like throughout the years. And the man who put it on, Casey Mulligan, a professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, Mulligan said, the Trump administration's agencies through four years reduced regulatory costs by almost $11,000 per household in present value. On an annual basis, President Trump was on net reducing regulatory costs more than $300 billion per year of rulemaking. That's almost as fast, listen to, this, listen to this, almost as fast as President Obama and Biden were creating them, $600 billion per year of rulemaking. And yet we heard the other day that Bidenomics, people love it. That's according to the White House of people. It's immensely popular, uh, Biden's economic plan. As you, you keep that in mind. When you go to the grocery store, when you fill up your gas tank, uh, when you maybe think of going on a vacation as we come up on July 4th holidays, they say it's going to be a big travel day. Think of those costs. I, everybody say travels, but <laughs> we're, we're told that the Biden economy is immensely popular. We've got to take another short break. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. <laughs> You are watching, frankly speaking, here on Big Fox, and we are in the Hesselson studio on Marcus Street in Corning. I'm your host, Frank Acom. A couple quick things to get to. We're nearly out of time. RFK Jr., someone that's being talked about a lot, uh, starting off right out the gate with 20%. Um, he's very popular, uh, favorability rating, too. I know the media's downplayed him, called him a wacko, and called him you know conspiracy theorist and all that, and, and you know he's definitely pushed some conspiracy theories in the past, but um, he's an interesting candidate. And the reason why there's the all out attack by the media is because clearly the Democrats and specifically the Biden administration are a little concerned. Well, they're giving him an interview on News Nation, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And they want him to attack Trump. You know, that they're looking for that, that uh, sound bite. They said, you know, you've been getting a lot of support from voices like Steve Bannon. Tucker Carlson, Alex Jones, former President Donald Trump. And then they played a clip of Trump saying about RFK, he's been very nice to me. I've actually had a very nice relationship with him over the years. He's a very smart guy and a good guy. He's a common sense guy and so am I. So whatever you're, whether you're conservative or liberal, common sense is common sense. So Vargas, Elizabeth Vargas, the, the anchor at News Nation, says, what kind of man do you think Donald Trump is? See, they're going for that typical media media tactic so robert f kennedy jr took a different road you know if you would have gave this to a chris christie or a biden they would have just attack 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 he says here's what i'm gonna i'm not gonna do in this race here's what i'm not gonna do in this race i'm not gonna attack other people personally i don't think it's good for our country so i'm proud that president trump likes me even though i don't agree with him on most of his issues because i don't want to alienate people i want to bring people together I'm proud that all these people like me and that I have independent supporters and Democratic supporters. 
Every Democrat says, I want to end the polarization. But how do you do that without talking to people who don't agree with you? Yeah, that's a talking point from the left that uh, they want to end polarization as they call you bigot, racist, any kind of name in the book that they can uh, just because you disagree with them politically or uh, unfortunately as we talked about in the interview earlier, you know, to the point of violence at times and it's it's very uh, troubling. So I thought that was just a, a completely different take coming from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Something interesting. Hey, we got to take a short break, our last one, and then we'll be back with Frankly Speaking to wrap things up. Stay with us. We are back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Akam. A couple last things before we wrap up here with the program. And as always, you can contact me. I'd love to hear from you. What are your plans for July 4th? How about that? That's a question I'll throw out to you. You can text me at that number or you can uh, leave a voicemail as well. So uh, that is coming up very soon. I know that the theme of the show this morning has been <laughs> patriotism and high taxes um, or lack of patriotism, I guess, and high taxes. Uh, but I hope that you've enjoyed the program so far as you go into your weekend. Uh, I also, by the way, want to thank Robert J. Delahunty for being on the program, the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. And I also heard a lot of great things yesterday about the interview with the Honorable Amul Thapar. He's the author of The People's Justice, Clarence Thomas, and the Constitutional Stories That Define Him. So thank you to both of our guests in the last couple of days. All of our guests, always. Uh, we appreciate it. Quick story. Oh, by the way, it takes something like a traffic jam or something. This goes to show you a lot about the mindset and politics. If something affects you directly or personally, that's when you can change your tune pretty quickly. So, you know, the high inflation, the horrible economic plans of the Biden administration, the um, outrageous spending, whatever, that doesn't seem to bother certain people. But boy, oh boy, if he decides to take a trip and it closes down certain roads and causes a traffic jam, you may lose yourself some votes and you may even have some people changing party. For every day and every scandal of his presidency, says James Bovard, President Biden could count on unflinching support from the Washington Post and its devoted readers. You know, that's very similar to the New York Times. That support, always defending. And then, of course, people like to be in a bubble, like-minded, and they go and comment, oh, yeah, great job, those type of things. Well, traffic on one of America's busiest roads screeched to a halt for hours, during rush hour, of all things. Biden was heading out on a trip. Where? To hit up a fundraiser. Oof. Not a good look. The shutdown caused more than five miles of backups, just disruptions for hours on end. You should see uh, one radio host in the area named Chris Planty called it Biden's Bridgegate. Now, that's a dig at Chris Christie, too. That's interesting. If you remember, Chris Christie had the Bridgegate scandal. Also, if you watch this program for any amount of time, you know that throwing gate at the end of anything is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Not everything. <laughs> that doesn't just make something a scandal because you throw gate. Behind it. I'm not sticking up for Bridgegate. It's the only name for it. Sorry. Uh, but I just as a side note, sorry. The story behind the road closure is unfolding, but the rage is already on record. Liz Martin railed in the comment section. This was terrible timing. Right at rush hour, the lack of consideration for us, quote, normal people is infuriating. Ooh. Uncle Mo raged. Four hours of my life I can't get back. This has single-handedly cost my capital D Democrat vote for you, sleepy Uncle Joe. <laughs> and listen, even for the Washington Post to report on this, uh, it was an unnecessary and boneheaded move by the Secret Service. What a ridiculous route, President. There are about a million better and more direct ways to go. Uh, I thought one of the funnier ones, someone asked, why not have the reception at 8 o'clock so it doesn't uh, affect Russia? Or why can't he get his money at some other time for this big fundraiser. A Post reader reply, replied, a Washington Post said, well, it's past his bedtime. We are out of time for today's edition of Frankly Speaking. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Have a fun, safe weekend. We'll be back. So make sure you tune in, starting at 7 o'clock weekday mornings with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. I'm just trying to find our end credits. There we go. Have a great weekend. <laughs>